I want to thank uh, Mark and John for coming because uh, they, they, they could have backed out looking at this weather. If you looked at the weather forecast, you, we'd all be uh, at home with our own generators. But uh, anyway, this is going to be a great program, and the weather is fine, and it's worked. Could I please ask if you would turn your cell phones and other electronic devices off? And I might just add that Mark and John just completed about a 45-minute session with our students. So I hope you all ask as good and provocative questions as, as, as they did. It was a fascinating session, and this is a fascinating topic. Um, and so we're really glad to have them here. They came here in 2000, uh, well, after the, the, the publication of, of Game Change. And, uh, and so now we're here for Double Down. To introduce them is Clinton School student Chad Hallen from Asheville, North Carolina, one of my favorite cities in this country. Uh, uh, Chet worked with AmeriCorps uh, in Western North Carolina. At the Clinton School, he's worked uh, on a team project uh, about the feasibil feasibility of a federal court reentry system in central Arkansas. He worked on youth programs in the country of Columbia. And right now, he's working with the Arkansas Energy Office on, on setting standards for licensing uh, compressed natural gas uh, usage in vehicles. So uh, he has a strong interest in the environment. He worked in the Obama campaign in 2008 in North Carolina. He returned to North Carolina in 2012 to work in the Obama campaign. He is, as I would describe, and seem to know fairly well, a political animal. Would you please welcome Clinton School student Chet Hallen. Thank you all for braving the weather to be here. I'm sure it'll be worth your while. I'd like you to think briefly back to the 2012 presidential election. Do you remember where we were on election night? If you're here, considering the icy conditions, I assume you might have been at an election night party or, at the very least, watching the returns at home. On the night of November 6, 2012, I found myself in the break room of a Teamsters union in Greensboro, North Carolina, surrounded by fast food wrappers and empty pizza boxes, when I should have been here in Little Rock working with my Clinton School practicum team. I hadn't slept more than two hours in two weeks, and I'd worn the same suit for six consecutive days. There were three other people in the room with me a film director from Oregon who had missed the premiere of one of his movies to be with us, my former field director, who had postponed her wedding to come to Greensboro, and the DNC director of Faith Outreach, who, a pastor from New Jersey who had stayed in North Carolina even though her church had been irrevocably damaged by Superstorm Sandy. We were four people thousands of miles away from where we were supposed to be. So what brought such disparate people to Union Hall in North Carolina? Well, the answer, oddly enough, was President Obama's disaster of a first debate performance against Governor Romney in early October. The President had appeared disinterested and disdainful of his opponent, and the ramifications of his thorough beating were felt even by people as unimportant as I am. Within 24 hours of the debates, I had received a call asking me to drop whatever I was doing, fly back to North Carolina, and head up get-out-the-vote efforts in Central NC. As an aside, obviously didn't do that great of a job because it was the one battleground state that we ended up losing in the election. I bring up this anecdote not to be immodest or self-congratulatory, but to highlight the constant chaos and state of uncertainty in American presidential campaigns. Our speakers tonight, Mark Halpern and John Heilman, have done perhaps the best job of chronicling the general insanity of a presidential campaign since Hunter Thompson in Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail. In Game Change, their New York Times bestselling account of the 2008 election, Halperin and Heilman detailed the heated primary race between then-Senators Obama and Clinton with a heavy focus on John McCain's game-changing selection of Sarah Palin as his running mate. In Double Down, their sequel focusing on this past election, our authors pick up the story in 2011 with conversations within the Obama administration over whether to dump Vice President Joe Biden from the ticket for once rival and then-Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Halpern and Heilman also spend considerable time examining the once frosty but now amiable relationship between President Obama and our school's founder, former President Clinton. Through the twists and turns of the Republican primaries all the way up to and past that aforementioned first debate, Halpern and Heilman provide an unparalleled level of access into the inner workings of the highest levels of political campaigning in this country. 
This is the insider's insider account, based on over 500 interviews with closely affiliated operatives and consultants. Mark Halpern and John Heilman's respective bodies of work speaks for themselves. Both graduates of Harvard, Mark Halpern is the senior political analyst at both Time Magazine and MSNBC, with over a decade of previous experience as political director at ABC News. John Heilman is currently the national affairs editor at New York Magazine, with past stints at The New Yorker, Wired, and The Economist. He is also a political analyst for MSNBC, and both gentlemen appear often on Morning Joe and other programs on the cable channel. As someone who lives and breathes this kind of thing, I am thrilled to welcome Mark Halpern and John Heilman to the stage for the ultimate insider's perspective on the 2012 presidential election. Thank you. Chet? <laughs> yes. Oh, there you are. Um, thank you for that gracious introduction. Apart from the preamble, you read it just like we wrote it. <laughs> and we appreciate that. We're um, thrilled to be here. Um, I have to take a picture of Mark, as I always do at the beginning of everything. Um, we're thrilled to be here. Um, we are um, about a month after uh, publishing this book, and we've been around the country um, from coast to coast and back, uh, talking about Double Down uh, in a lot of different states, in a lot of different cities, in a lot of different places. And I can say unequivocally that this is the absolute favorite place of all the places we've ever been. We love Arkansas. <laughs> And I, I promise you, I swear to God, I haven't said that anyplace else, anywhere, at, at, no, at no other venues. Um, uh, we, we are really thrilled to be here. We've, uh, we've had um, a lot of nice things um, said. Chet said a few nice things here, and we've had a lot of nice things said about the book. I will share with you, um, we had a, a lot of nice things said about the first book, and we've had a lot of nice things said about this book. It's very gratifying for us. There's, we've had one accolade. Um, given to this book that exceeds all the accolades that either of the books has ever obtained ever before, which is we've been endorsed by the North Korean government. <laughs> you, you laugh, you think I'm kidding about that, but the other day um, I had a news alert, a Google news alert that said something about North Korea, and so I looked at it, it was a story in the Washington Post which had the headline, uh, North Korea endorses Double Down as proof that, quote, the U.S. is the root cause of all sorts of evils. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's actually very gratifying. There's only one book club in the world more powerful than the Oprah book club, and that's the Kim Jong-un book club. <laughs> so we're excited about that. Um, I'm going to talk for a few minutes, and then Mark's going to talk for a few minutes, and then we're going to take questions and answers. Um, we're always more eager to hear what you guys have to say than anything that we have to tell you, but we will, um, we will talk for a little bit. Um, how many people in the room have read the, read the book Game Change, the first one? Okay, fantastic. So some of you are familiar with that book. Um, this book is in many ways a continuation of, of what we did with the first book, and, um, and they're, they're, Mark's going to talk a little bit more about the process by which we do what we do and, and how these books get written. Um, I'll just say that you know the, the, they, they are really very similar in, in one crucial respect, which is that they really focus to a large extent on the kind of high human drama of politics. We're, we're great students of, of all aspects of government and policy and politics. Um, yeah, we love um, governance and policy and, um, and, and demography and data. We love all those things. Um, but in these books, what we're really focused on is the human dimension of politics, the people who run for president, the kind of extraordinary, amazing, ambitious, egomaniacal, narcissistic, idealistic people who put themselves forward into this incredible competition um, in American life. And we like to write about those people and what it's like to run for president, how it feels for them, how the experience changes them, how their strengths and weaknesses are borne out in uh, the competition for the highest office in the land. Um, a, a lot of people um, asked us after we did the first book, which we titled um, Game Change, Obama and the Clintons, McCain and Palin, and the Race of a Lifetime, um, what we were going to do after having called one race the race of a lifetime. It was kind of tricky to do the second race. Um, you say, well, the second best race of a lifetime, the race of another lifetime. Um, and that book obviously covered a race that had an extraordinary amount of drama uh, in it. Um, for a period of time, I would glibly say, when people would say, well, how are you ever going to write about this race? It's nowhere near as dramatic as the last race. And I would say, well, there are different kinds of narratives. Some races are, are dramas and others are comedies. Um, and 2012 certainly had a fair amount of comedy in it, especially on the Republican side. We had, as you will recall, 
Um, one candidate, Herman Cain, who referred to a country on earth as who's Becky, 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 Stan, Stan. Um, we had um, another candidate, Michelle Bachman, who confused the hometown of John Wayne and John Wayne Gacy, the serial killer. <laughs> And uh, Newt Gingrich, who concluded his estimable and, and epic career in American politics by taking a tour of the country's zoos and being bitten by a penguin. So there's, that's, a little, that's a lot of material to, to work with. Um, and, and there is, even among the candidates, Republican candidates, who are not particularly funny, uh, Governor Romney, for instance, not a particularly funny guy. Uh, Rick Santorum, kind of almost the definition of not funny. Um, there's even some humor there. At one point in, in this book, in Double Down, we report about John McCain uh, making his decision about which uh, which of the candidates to endorse. He was down to a choice between Romney and Santorum, and he was weighing that, and he eventually told Governor Romney that he was endorsing Governor Romney. He had decided that the choice had come down to the dog-on-roof guy over versus the dog-on-man dog on man guy, and he preferred the dog-on-roof guy to the dog-on-man guy. So even that has produced, has produced a, few, a few laughs. Um, I'm going to talk, uh, for the last few minutes that I, I talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about one story in the book that is full of um, drama and comedy and uh, consequence in this race, and in particular import given the setting that we're in today. It also includes a fair amount of profanity, um, and so you obviously know that I'm talking about a story that involves the Clintons. Um, <laughs> when, when we wrote um, Game Change, we, we sometimes would say that we thought the first book was the story of the, of the love affair, the romance between Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. Um, it's classic romance, you know, boy meets girl, boy likes girl, girl likes boy, boy and girl spend a year trying to beat the hell out of each other, and then eventually they end up married. That's basically how romances work um, in politics, and they end up married politically, of course, when Secretary, when Secretary, Senator Clinton decided to become Secretary of State Clinton for Barack Obama. This book is more focused on the romance between Barack Obama and Bill Clinton, between the 42nd and 44th presidents of the United States, and it is also kind of a classic romance in a lot of ways. The two uh, presidents presidents, a president, former president, current president, not really having much of a relationship through most of the president's first term, um, not ending 2008 in a great place, um, President Clinton having a lot of opinions, wanting to express them as he was wont to, uh, wanting to tell President Obama what he thought about things, kind of marveling at President Obama. Um, he would say to his friends that President Obama um, does all the hard things extraordinarily well. He was kind of a, he was very impressed by President Obama having passed health care reform, something that he had not been able to do. Um, but at the same time, he would say he doesn't do the easy things at all. The things that President Clinton found like as easy as falling off a log, you know, the the, the schmoozing of, of donors and, and and congressmen on Capitol Hill, the basic blocking and tackling of apocalypse. Blocking and tackling of politics. Um, these are the things President Obama didn't do at all. President Clinton couldn't figure that out and was constantly confounded by it. But he wasn't really asked his opinion very often. President Obama, not a guy who reaches out very much beyond his inner circle under any circumstances, didn't particularly have bad feelings about President Clinton, but just didn't really feel like he needed him. Um, but all of that changed um, at the end of 2011 after President Obama had gone through both the midterm election losses of 2010 um, and then the, the kind of the, the, the huge cataclysmic, nearly cataclysmic uh, debt ceiling crisis of the summer of 2011, President Obama in the worst place of his political life at that point, um, approval ratings uh, down around 40%, um, the, the economy still in the tank, unemployment very high, GDP growth very slow, two-thirds of the country thinking the country's on the wrong track. And the president's advisors, President Obama's advisors, really believing at that point that he was no better than a 50-50 chance for re-election. Many of the people around him thought that he was an underdog. Um, president Obama told one of his top aides when the president was asked what President Obama thought of his own prospects, he said, I think I'm in deep. And at that point, he decided, along with the rest of his team, to do something that he normally didn't do. He decided it was time to reach out to President Clinton um, and, and try to get President Clinton's help. And so, as is the way of American politics, um, the first overture, the beginning of the courtship, was to uh, have uh, the two uh, presidents go and play a round of golf. So, off they went to Andrews Air Force Base to uh, try to begin the process of mending fences and bringing them back together. Um, president Obama's attitude towards golf is very Obama. He um, he is a, the president of the United States. He has a very serious schedule. He likes to stick to it. He likes to get up and down 18 holes, two and a half hours, get back to the White House, get back to work, down to business, play the game, get it over with. President Clinton has a slightly different attitude towards golf. <laughs> 
he is, as you know, a retiree, um, and, and, and also um, and also very fond of the mulligan and and other uh, extracurricular activities on the fairway, including expounding on everything under the sun. Um, they uh, their golf game did not take two and a half hours; it took many many more hours than that, and they did not finish 18 holes. Um, and when President Obama left the golf course, feeling a little frustrated with having been lectured to for many many hours by President Clinton, he was asked by one of his aides, "Well, how did that go?" And President Obama said, uh, I like him in doses. <laughs> but things from there got better, and by the summer of 2011, after President Obama had gotten a chance to hear President Clinton talk about him in private at, at donor events, at, at fundraisers, he would hear President Clinton talk about him very passionately with, with a lot of conviction about his record, about his vision for the future. President Obama was really touched and really struck and, and, and began to bring Bill Clinton more and more into his world, put him uh, in the great, in the high uh, uh, visibility position of giving the big speech in Charlotte that everybody saw at the Democratic Convention, President Clinton grateful for the opportunity to carry uh, the ball forward for President Obama, gave an incredible speech, uh, one of the kind of uh, great speeches really of President Clinton's political career. And the, the, and they really, by that point, were beginning to really forge a bond. By the time that Hurricane Sandy hit, uh, you had uh, President Clinton and President Obama together on the eve of the storm in Florida, um, about to do an event the next morning. President Obama decided he had to go back to Washington as the uh, hurricane was bearing down on New York City, uh, President Clinton said, you know, you go be president, um, Barack, and I'll pick up the slack for you over this last week. And so while President Obama was pinned down, um, pretty much being commander in chief and, and, and dealing with uh, disaster relief, President Clinton crossed the country um, doing event after event, six events a day uh, for four or five days when President Obama was off the trail, um, really campaigning as if his own name were on the ballot. Um, and by the end, on election day, on election night, um, you have uh, two guys who had started out without much regard for each other or much affection, um, and gradually through mutual need and dependency coming to this place of mutual respect and even affection, President Obama on election night, uh, receiving the call from Mitt Romney, uh, conceding the election to him, President Clinton, President Obama hanging up the phone and immediately saying to his campaign manager, get Bill Clinton on the phone, I want to thank him for everything he did. First phone call that President Obama made on election night um, was to President Clinton, um, which is really kind of an extraordinary thing. There there's no way anybody would have ever pre predicted that the two men would have been in that place even a year earlier, let alone four years earlier when things were so bitter between them. Uh, we can talk in Q&A about what all this means for the future if you guys are interested uh, uh, to think about the ways in which the Clinton and Obama alliance as families, as political families, and their unification, their unlikely unification at the over the course of, of that campaign and over the course of the months that have fallen uh, since Election Day, what that means for Hillary Clinton's prospects. Um, Mark and I both think it means a lot, actually, and there are a variety of ways in which it's become increasingly clear that President Obama is really quietly, but significant, in significant ways, um, really behind Hillary Clinton and the possibility that she will run for president in 2016. Um, I'll close just by saying that, you know, through all of this, President Clinton remains uh, you know, a singular figure and, and one um, who throughout the book Double Down, which I really do recommend you buy, it's available widely at bookstores and Amazon.com in a variety of different formats, um, makes it a fantastic holiday gift. Um, um, <laughs> Uh, President, President Clinton remains, above, above all else, a great character, but also a very pithy pundit. Um, at one point in September, uh, after the 47% video had been released and Governor Romney was really um, uh, on the, the down, at the, the low point of his campaign in a lot of ways, and President Obama, despite all of his difficulties, was somehow hovering and still maintaining a, a reasonable lead over Governor Romney. President Clinton was asked by some friends what he thought of Governor Romney. And President Clinton had got to know Governor Romney pretty well by that point. He said, I think he's a very, very nice man who's in the wrong line of work. He, he should not be speaking to people in public. <laughs> Um, he was asked around the same time what he, uh, what they what they thought of President Obama at that point, and uh, he bestowed um, well, he, he he remarked on on the on the good fortune that had, had uh, that seemed to have been conferred on President Obama. Um, he said that he was um, luckier than a dog would. <laughs> I, now you know here in Arkansas apparently that's a common phrase I'm told. Um, yeah, yeah, yesterday, yesterday, uh, yesterday at another event, someone from Arkansas came up to us and said, when you get down to Little Rock, you'll find that's a tame expression by, <laughs> by Little Rock standards. I, I don't really fully understand it. I guess only President Clinton can understand the virtues of being a two-
but, um, <laughs> but apparently it's the luckiest thing you can be on this planet. Um, I will hand over to Mark now because generally when I get to the point where I start talking about animal gen genitalia, that's usually a good sign for me to hand off. Um, so th thank you for listening and, and, and uh, uh, Mark, you stay classy. <laughs> Thank you all for coming uh, on a night like this, and to thank uh, Skip Rutherford and the, this uh, school for hosting us. It's great to be here. I spent a fair amount of time here over the course of my career, particularly in 1991 and 1992, when um, as a relatively young reporter for ABC News, I was assigned to cover uh, governor of Arkansas full time uh, and uh, got to spend a lot of time at the Capitol Hotel. Uh, where regularly when they'd give me my faxes, uh, James Carville's faxes would be stuck underneath and that seemed fine with them and fine with me as well. So um, I'm, I'm happy to be back. We're gonna, I'm going to talk for just a little bit about, a, a bit, a bit more about the book itself uh, and then we're going to do Q&A. Uh, as far as we're concerned, nothing's off limits during Q&A. You can ask whatever you want. You can ask about uh, media or politics or anything. Uh, all, the only rule we have during Q&A is all the questions have to be in the form of true-false. So <laughs> as you're thinking of questions, you think about it in those terms. Uh, we have traveled a lot um, uh, uh, around the country talking about the book. Um, we were in Texas the other day, and John uh, very um, smoothly closed with his story about President Clinton and his metaphor. Uh, people in Texas, for some reason, said to us it confirmed everything they always think about Arkansas. Not really sure what they meant by that. But, um, but uh, it's, uh, it's daunting to speak here because there are a few places, I know from my time covering President Clinton and Governor Huckabee, uh, I know there are a few places in the country that are as politically sophisticated as you all are because uh, it's a kind of a contact sport and a, a universal hobby here. So it's a little daunting. Uh, I'm reminded of one of President Kennedy's favorite lines, which I'll paraphrase here, is this, I feel like in this room now there's more political talent gathered in one place uh, anywhere in Arkansas with the possible exception of when Rex Nelson dined alone. So I know, I know you all are pretty savvy, so I'm going to speak in, speak in some shorthand. Um, we, uh, we, we liked the writing these books quite a bit. Uh, both were fun, enjoyable experiences. Some of you probably know the, the first book. Uh, was made into an HBO movie, um, and that was a, a fun experience as well. Um, HBO is thinking of making a movie about this book as well. They've optioned it. Uh, one of the challenges they'd obviously have is casting that part of that dog. Um, but, <laughs> um, but we'll see. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. But the. Uh, the, the fact is that, that part of why HBO was interested in, in buying the first book, they bought the rights from us before we even written the, wrote the book and they did the same thing in this case, is while the two races aren't identical and, and the first race was a race of a lifetime, pretty interesting characters in both books, uh, pretty compelling figures, people who put themselves forward to run for president, in our view, they're all compelling for one reason or another. It's an extraordinary thing to do. In this race you had not only uh, the, 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 the president, a compelling figure, and, and President Clinton, who obviously, as John outlined, was a huge character in the race, but also on the Republican side, um, a, a party desperate to win back the White House uh, with, from the beginning, a front runner in Governor Romney who was neither the favorite of the Tea Party nor the favorite of the establishment, seen by, by both groups as a very weak front runner, uh, both ripe for the taking if the right candidate got in the race, uh, and, uh, and if he did win the nomination, someone they were quite concerned would not be able to beat the president. And yet, they failed to come up with someone to beat him. So we write in the book, in part, about the people who didn't run. People like Mitch Daniels of Indiana, Haley Barber of uh, Louisiana, um, or, uh, Mississippi, um, uh, and uh, Governor Huckabee, uh, who, and Governor Christie, all of whom chose to pass on the race. And the personal stories of why they chose to pass were very interesting to us. We devote a fair amount of that time to that in the book. In the first book, we, we broke a little news about Hillary Clinton that didn't get that much attention. But one thing we found in reporting that book was that in 2004, she gave a lot more consideration to running for president president than, than was known at the time. And one of the people who was urging her to run uh, said, this is your time. This is when you should be running for president. You can beat George Bush. And she chose not to, uh, as, as was the case with a lot of people who chose not to run this time, mostly for personal reasons. But this whole notion of whether it's someone's time to run or not is something that we found fascinating in the first book and in this book. President Obama 
audaciously ran in 2008 because he felt it was his time and, and, and it wasn't a good idea to wait. Casting more votes in the Senate, logging more time in Washington, he didn't feel was necessary and in fact maybe counterproductive. In this case, for a variety of mostly personal reasons, but, but also some professional reasons, you saw the people I listed, plus Jeb Bush, plus a few others, decide not to run. And uh, no one who ran in, in what was a relatively weak field turned out to be strong enough to beat uh, Governor Romney, even though, again, not the favored candidate of either of the d dominant wings of the party uh, and, and, uh, and a flawed candidate in a lot of ways. Um, so that, that story of, uh, on the Democratic side, President Obama grappling with how to run for re-election at a time when uh, he'd achieved a lot of what he wanted to achieve, but he hadn't brought the country together, the economy was still weak, and then, as John alluded to, the, the challenge of bringing Bill Clinton into the fold. That's kind of the heart of our story on the Democratic side. And on the Republican side, this kind of puzzle where you've got uh, a party desperate to win but unable to get the right person in the race who's able to win. And all of the reasons uh, that we write about in the book uh, that Governor Romney wasn't able to win, all of those were not only foreseeable but foreseen by some of the richest people in the country, millionaires and billionaires who lobbied very hard to get Mitch Daniels and then Chris Christie into the race, by a lot of Tea Party activists who said our strongest argument against the incumbent is Obamacare and we're going to nominate someone who passed a, a law in Massachusetts with an uh, individual mandate. Uh, they saw all the limits Governor Romney had and both both sides of the, of the party and a lot of consultants and a lot of other politicians saw Governor Romney lacking the kind of touch for retail politics that matter in the presidential level uh, that Bill Clinton has obviously and George Bush and Barack Obama all had. So that kind of slow motion tragedy for the Republican Party is a big part of our story on that side. Again, the people who didn't run and didn't run and then the, the people who did run in their, um, their uh, overall weakness and inability to stop Governor Romney, although again, given his weakness, uh, uh, taken uh, to the brink of defeat by Newt Gingrich and then by Rick Santorum. So that's kind of the, the, the sort of our major characters. And we approach both books the same way. We think about um, trying to focus on, as John said, the high human drama of running for president, what it's like. And we think about sort of for every, every one of the characters in any given instance, if we're writing about a scene, Think about what's the challenge the character's facing, the person's facing at that time. How do they feel about the challenge? And what do they think they need to do about it and then what they do about it? Uh, and that uh, sort of orientation, if, if you read the book, you'll see guides a lot of, of what we write because we're not writing a book about polling or about the results of every primary and caucus. We're writing, trying to get with as much empathy as possible and journalistic detachment at the same time, trying to get inside the heads, behind the eyes of, of people as they face the twists and turns of running for president. And, and in terms of the, how we think about, uh, uh, you know, making a book about a campaign relevant, you know, a lot of people say to us, it's a year after the election, this thing's been covered over and over, why would anyone still care? It takes you a full year to get the book out. Um, two responses to that. One is, you know, with all due respect to a friend and colleague of ours, it took Doris Kearns Goodwin 100 years to finish a Roosevelt book. So <laughs> by that standards, we feel we're, we're kind of ahead of the game. But the other thing is, you know, in journalism today, uh, in our daily lives and in our colleagues' daily lives, you got Twitter pressure, you know, constantly. I've not tweeted now for 45 minutes. My bosses are just, you know, but furious at me because I'm not providing content while I'm up here talking. Magazines, newspapers, website, going on TV. And there's no time to do the kind of interviewing we do for these books, as John said, 500 interviews, and that's that provides a lot of rich material. And it allows us to do two things. One is to tell the story behind the story of big public events, uh, big unanswered questions, which in real time the press is obsessed with, the public's interested in, but if the answer is not yielded, and it never is in 48 hours, the parade moves on to something else. So uh, why didn't the people I listed before run? How close did Chris Christie come to running? How did President Obama decide he needed Bill Clinton's help, and how did that courtship evolve? Uh, how did Clint Eastwood end up on the stage at the convention? Um, uh, that th those are big things. Some of them, some of them have huge consequences for the election. You know, how did Mitt Romney end up at a fundraiser late night in Florida and utter the 47 percent line? Some of those things have huge consequences, and unpacking the history of that, the humanity of that, is important. Some of them don't have much consequence necessarily in a linear way to the outcome, but they're just big, important stories that people wonder about. And then the other thing we try to do is take people uh, to the events that aren't known, 
uh, at the time. Um, one of the things in the book that was most satisfying for us in terms of as reporters and as storytellers was a story that occurs, it's the prologue of our book, and then we pick it back up in, in chronological order, about President Obama, who on the eve of the second debate with Governor Romney, after his disastrous first debate performance that was alluded to earlier, had uh, a performance breakdown in his debate rehearsal 48 hours before that debate, and his team does an intervention with him uh, the next day that um, is an extraordinary conversation between between the President of the United States just a few weeks before Election Day uh, and his closest aides in which they tell him that if he has another bad performance he could lose the election and he explains to him why he's having such trouble. John referred earlier to the kind of unusual uh, development of Barack Obama admitting he needed someone else's help. He said, I need Bill Clinton's help, in effect, to win this election, and he starts courting him. In the case of this intervention, he, he did something he rarely does. He said, I'm not sure I can do this. I'm not sure I'm wired right to perform any better in this second debate than I was in the first debate. And while it freaked his aides out to hear him 48 hours, or a, a day, uh, rather, before the second debate, in some ways they were comforted by that, because up until that point, he had been typical, confident Barack Obama saying, I got this, I'm not gonna lose two in a row. To hear him say, I don't know that I can do this, they felt, well, he's kind of hit bottom. That's good in an intervention for your inter intervention need to have hit bottom. And, and then they talked through how to come back. And the way they did that, I don't want to give the whole story away, uh, but, but the way they sort of worked with him in that last day to get him to come back and perform well enough in the second debate to stop the uh, political bleeding uh, is, a, is a really interesting story to us and again part of history. Um, we feel like a lot of what we report in these books would be lost forever if we didn't do it. We've got relationships with people whose memories are short uh, as all of ours are and um, it, it would be very hard for any historian or journalist five years from now, ten years from now, any time down the road to go back and try to reconstruct the, these events. Campaigns don't leave behind a great deal of record. There are some notes, some emails um, around and, and recordings, but a lot of what, what pulls the story together is the accumulation of all the interviews. And again, some of these people uh, would forget things, some of them would not be available, people move on, and so uh, we feel like, like uh, taking the year that we do, trying to salvage things as much as we can in real time and then intensely after the election provides a, a narrative that uh, is different than what else is written during the campaign. And uh, we, hope, we hope people find useful and interesting. For us, it's really been the most rewarding professional things we've done because, uh, because of the nature of uh, uh, the, this, the, 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 value, the volume of the interviews and the fact that, unlike a lot of journalism today, it, it, it cuts across both parties. We have sources in both parties, and we'd like to think that we tell the story of both the Republicans and the Democrats, not just uh, equally well, but with equal fairness. And again, in, in today's journalism, that's not always done or always possible. I'm gonna stop there in, in, in part because I wanna make sure I leave enough time for the Q&A, and in part because uh, that is the longest I've spoken on the book tour without somebody yelling at you lie, um, <laughs> which, always throws me off a little bit. So uh, thank the school again for inviting us and for you all for coming out and we'll take whatever questions you have. Well, when the uh, world sees John's quote about dogs in Arkansas, um, not sure there'll be a school. No, just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Andrew DeMillo can report that in a very favorable way. Um, let me uh, let me start. Imagine by, any other way than a favorable way to report. That. I'm not going there, John. I'm not going there. Uh, I, 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 we'll, we'll we'll talk about that later. Um, the uh, the thing I wanted before we go, I'm going to ask you something that, that we talked a little bit about in the student session, and that is the death today of of, of Nelson Mandela. Can you discuss that in terms of sort of America, America's politics, what, what happens now with the former presidents and the current president? Because this is, as you described, I think, John, no one like him in our lifetime. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, we've been talking about this ever since the word of anybody who doesn't know, um, Nelson Mandela passed away today. and. Um, you know, there will be, in the next few days, there will be a, a, a funeral um, in, probably in Johannesburg, I guess, and I, I don't think we will ever have, the, in, in most, I don't think in our lifetimes anybody will have seen anything like this. Um, because of Mandela's significance as a symbol, 
um, beyond his the actual things he accomplished in South Africa, his, symbol, his global symbolism. Um, he's a head of state who means an extraordinary amount to virtually every corner of the globe. And so I think you will see every head of state will go, and most former heads of states will go. Um, the level of, um, of, of most African American leaders, I think, from this country will want to go. I think the only question will be how much capacity there is. I mean, literally, the, 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 the everyone who can go will go. And I, I think it will be, a, 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 on a global scale, considerably more, um, more of a spectacle than you know the the death of President Reagan or the death of President Nixon or or someone like that. I think this is, was a is a very big deal, and, and he really is you know uh, singular in the sense that um, his his political contribution. I, I I said at the session earlier. I spent a little bit of time in South Africa during apartheid and a little, and sometime in South Africa after apartheid. And I don't know that there's a country, including the Eastern Bloc countries, where there's been a more radical transformation from the period before um, before uh, normalization and, and after. Uh, it's a, a radical, radical change. And there are problems in South Africa, just there are problems in every country, but now a relatively functioning democracy in which there's a uh, majority rule um, is uh, and it, it's really quite something compared to what it was in the dark days of not that long ago, when, you know, when most of us can still remember in the late 1980s, early 1990s, and the fact that Mandela coming out of prison performed the extraordinary political, strategic, and tactical maneuvers that were necessary to bring unification about and to do it in a peaceful way and to get the country to where it is now, he is singularly responsible for that political goal, for that political accomplishment. But he's also just a, a, I think as a human being, someone endowed with an extraordinary level of grace. And, and there, there are not many people who have been heads of state who put in the position that he had been in, imprisoned for so many years, so much of his life snapped away from him, could come, snatched away from him, could come out of prison, face the political challenges he faced, and do it with such equanimity and forgiveness. Um, he's, he's really something close to um, a secular saint, and it's the kind of thing, you know, to have, have granted forgiveness to the people who oppressed him and the way that he did um, to have, have ushered through that kind of spiritual reconciliation in the country is really a magnificent, quite extraordinary thing. And there are a lot of, of incredible words that will be spoken, I think, about Mandela in the course of the next uh, week to 10 days. And it's a rare situation where almost nothing that's said about him will be hyperbolic. I think the, the, the reality of the man is greater than all of the encomiums that we're about to hear. It really is, um, it really is quite a moment, I think, for, for, for the world. Mark, do you think you on that? No, that's all good. OK. All right. Now, questions, and please raise your hands, and uh, we'll get the microphone to you. All right, Denver Peacock, you said, here's Denver Peacock, guys, you all were hey talking guys. about just, it. Just read off the teleprompter like we <laughs> talked about. Hey, talk about the sourcing. Uh, you have your 500 interviews, but both of you report daily for your publication, so uh, just share with us how you convince your sources to, and some things you're going to hold off, some things you're not going to report on, but yet your publishers or your bosses want you to report that information, you know, immediately. So I think you, you, just that dichotomy of working through that and then uh, just help us to understand uh, the, the process and helping gather that, those sources. Hard to believe a man that handsome could be that articulate, too. <laughs> we are in Arkansas. <laughs> have to make up for that Texas joke, which people do not love, apparently. Um, we do all the interviews that we do for the book very explicitly with people for the book, and our 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 regular employers know that we're working on the book. And you know, it's 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 easy to imagine that there'd be conflicts in that, but there really aren't because people who are doing the book interviews know again it's for a specific project. Not we say at the beginning of all the interviews, it's not for our TV work, our magazines, or website, or Twitter, uh, and they wouldn't be forthcoming the way they are. So it's not like we could get the same information and have it in the magazines. People are cooperating because understand what the project's for and that the interviews are on what we call deep background, which means we're not going to identify the sources of the information. You know, it'd be great to live in a world where everybody would be fully transparent and we'd, we could do the interviews on the record in real time and publish it right away, but uh, just the, the, the way human nature works, understandably so, and, and political reality is, if we don't promise them that in, I mean, if they don't know it's for a large project coming out a year after the election, they're just not going to tell us the same kind of things, and, and our, our publishers know that. Um, 
And at the same time, you know, th these interviews are not uh, confrontational in the main. Very few of them are. Uh, they're mostly like oral histories. We're just asking people to tell the stories of what happened and accumulate the information. Uh, most of the interviews are done, as I think one of us said already, after the election. And so uh, there's not, there's almost never anything we sort of fully pieced together, ready to write, ready to publish until pretty close to publication because we're constantly reporting, constantly looking for the right details. The, the, the firm, firm enough confirmation to publish, and so it is a little bit. It is a little bit time consuming to be doing magazine interviews and then book interviews in the same period when that's when that's the case before the election. But in terms of sort of conflict or or confusion about sources about where it's going to go, we don't have that because again, we're so explicit with people about what we're doing. Uh, Alex Thomas, I'll get you, Nate. Thank you both for coming back to the Clinton School. We really appreciate uh, hearing from you guys again. A uh, couple of really maybe smaller questions, one relating to the book, another relating to just kind of media and the arts, I guess. Uh, the first question is, given the success of both of these books, are you guys anticipating that really every election you guys can come together and create, that there's narrative to create, there's narrative there. I was wondering if you guys have given thought to future books and future cycles, and the second, question is not about the book, but I'd just love to hear your thoughts on two TV shows, uh, House of Cards and the other Political Animals. Political Animals really paralleled a lot with the Clinton uh, narrative, and I'd love to just hear your thoughts on, on those shows. So first about the book, the second about the TV shows. Thank you. Yeah, good question on the book. You've, I'm, I'm anxious to hear that myself, since you avoided it the last time I tried to ask you that question. <laughs> You know, with all due respect, Mark just talked a second ago about how he hasn't tweeted in 45 minutes and his bosses are impatiently um, hounding him to tweet. You know, we, we spent three years working on this book. It came out a month ago and you're already hassling us about the next book. <laughs> I mean, come on, dude, give us a break, you know? Um, and that's the honest answer. That's not an evasive answer. We're, you know, we've loved doing these two books. Mark just said they were the most satisfying things of our professional careers. It's totally true. Um, but. You know, we are just in, still in the early phases of, of, of trying to get people to buy this book. And did I mention before this makes it a great holiday gift? <laughs> Available in a lot of different formats, electronic book, you know, hardcover. Um, you know, it's also, it's just a huge commitment of, it's a huge commitment to decide to do it again. We worked for three years on this book, and as Mark said, it's a labor, you know, it's a laborious thing because we have all these other day jobs we do in magazines and on television and on the web and other places. So I think before we decide what we're gonna do about 2016, we're going to sell this book for a little while, and then we'll um, we'll give that some thought and figure out whether we can really make that kind of commitment again. We very well might, and we, you know we might not decide not to. It's just a big it's a big thing to decide to do. I haven't seen Political Animals, so I don't have a I have an opinion about that at all. Mark might. Um, I'm not a big fan of House of Cards, um, mostly because I think it's fine. It's entertaining, and and I, I think it's it's enter, it's entertaining. But I I, I generally like that there's a the the p political um, fiction on television and and in film, which I am a huge consumer of and love. I, I, I don't uh, and not. Uh, I don't love. I don't. There's there's a, a tendency that that some of it has to fall into reflexive cynicism about politics and about the people who are in politics. That kind of panders to um, what I think is a, 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 a an erroneous and corrosive sense of people in the country that everyone in Washington D.C. is a crook and everyone in Washington D.C. is involved in some nefarious business. Blah blah blah. There are some crooks and there's some nefarious business. By and large, most of the people we write about, for all their flaws and foibles are largely public spirited and trying to like do good things. And if there's any problem with Washington as a as a as a as a seedbed for narrative is that there's it's much more banal rather than you know the 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 kind of things that you see in House of Cards. Does that mean I'm not interested in having a good having a lot of fun? Eh, I, I like you know I like it fun like anybody, but the, the the political fiction that I that I get attracted to more tends to err on the other side, you know, like the, the I mean, the, the West Wing is not, a, is not an accurate representation of what the White House is either, but the thing I always liked about that was there's some core of it that represented the, the fundamental idealism and altruism of the people who were in that line of work, most of whom could be doing something else and making a lot more money rather than trying to move the ball forward on issues of national concern. And, you know, the, the, the House of Cards thing, I think, sometimes contributes to, the, to, a, to, to a kind of pernicious sense of the opposite. I've seen neither, but I like Veep a lot. <laughs> <laughs> a 
Okay, Nate, we got a question and an endorsement of Veep. We'll get you on that. Hi, I'm Nate Kennedy. I'm from Missouri. And uh, like Chet, in 2012, I was working for Senator McCaskill in Missouri before I came to the Clinton School. And of course, I left in early August. My hands were ringing because she was running behind. Then a few le weeks later, of course, everyone got to know Todd Aiken <laughs> and his comments on rape, which uh, really changed the dy dynamic of the race. I was wondering if the Romney campaign was kind of aware of how Aiken and the other candidate in Indiana was affecting the Republican brand nationally? Um, they were definitely aware of it. You know, one of the challenges for the Romney campaign was they wanted the election to be about President Obama's record on the economy. So if anything else came up, uh, like what happened in the Missouri race or in the Indiana race or attacks on Governor Romney on his record at Bain Capital, they felt a little bit torn. Did, did, they, did they engage on that stuff or did they just try to ignore it? Um, and uh, rather than sort of judge them case by case, for the most part, their attitude was, we're just going to ignore it. We'll let the press talk about it, but we're not going to fuel the story by, by uh, engaging very much. So even when um, Rush Limbaugh um, uh, made disparaging comments about a Georgetown law student, um, where it would have been an obvious opportunity to, for Governor Romney to speak up, he chose not to, in part because he didn't want to offend Rush Limbaugh, but in part because they didn't want to fuel stories that they thought would stick to them. You know, President Clinton's commitment to public service as embodied by the school is, is really one of his great contributions to American life, and, 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 uh, and there's no denying that um, that part of his legacy is going to endure for a very long time, not just through the students of the school, but because of the example that he set. He also is one of the craftiest political operatives ever. And he did something in 1992 uh, with this uh, rap artist, Sister Soldier, uh, that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. But the notion of doing a sister soldier, of, of speaking out against some, somebody in your own party or associated with, with the extreme wing of your party, in order to make a point but also to gain political advantage was uh, done brilliantly by President Clinton on occasion, including in that one. Uh, and Governor Romney chose never to do it, never took an opportunity like he could have done in the case of, of the Missouri Senate race to speak out in a way that would have alienated some members of his party for sure, but would have also um, given him a political advantage. And again, their attitude was, if we do that, we risk alienating the base where he didn't have the kind of support that President Clinton had, the base of the Democratic Party, but also we fuel the story. And the story goes on for several days. And we, every day that's not about uh, the economy and, and President Obama's record is a bad day. And, you know, I actually, in, in reporting the book, developed a little bit more intellectual sympathy for that strategy than I had during the campaign. But he lost. And so everything's ripe for second guessing. Front row, right here on the front row. Wait for the microphone here, right behind you. My name is Renaldo Williams, editor of the Empowerment Initiative online newsletter. You mentioned that uh, Obama had a breakdown in his second debate. Did you see that he was human just like anybody else, but yet determined to win the presidency because you know, anyone can fall, anyone can have a breakdown or a letdown, but then come right back strong. Uh, well, yeah, and I, I think you know, human in, in both in both senses. Um, you know, one of the the, the story that that Mark that Mark told briefly a little a second ago, and that question is referring to. You know, um, it, it's a, the, the the story of him of President Obama having this moment of self this this period of self doubt, this performance failure in the debate prep before the Hofstra debate and the sense of panic among his team, him admitting that he's not sure he's able to do it. An extraordinary moment of vulnerability um, and humanity and one that has real implications for explanatory implication, implications for a lot of what we've seen over the course of President Obama's term. He's a guy who, you know, uh, he, well, part of what was fueling that was a real deep antipathy for the theatricality of politics. He's a guy who is an extraordinary candidate, as he's proven in two successive elections, one of which he won against large historical odds, the second of which he won against 
a lot of objective metrics that, that would have suggested he couldn't win re-election. He's a great political performer uh, as a candidate, as good as anyone we've ever covered, but he doesn't really like doing it. He's not, he doesn't really like giving in, inspirational speeches. He, there, in the first book, we quoted him as kind of complaining at one point that everyone wanted him, every time he got out to speak, everyone wanted him to give the 2004 convention speech again, and all ex everybody expected to leave the room crying, and he kind of hated that. He kind of wanted to, he wanted to be a college professor and lead a, a, a irrational, more uh, intellectual searching kind of adult conversation, not um, manipulate his audience emotionally. He, and the debates were the same thing. He looked at them as a total sham. And he, he thought it was the worst examples of everything about soundbite culture. And so he was on his, you could say that was really admirable. You could also say he, he was up on his high horse about it. Um, but in either case, he didn't like that element of performance. That in combination with his, his dislike for Governor Romney and his sense that, again, very revealing sense that he felt like he didn't, he hadn't really been campaigning with a full agenda. And so his team kept saying, talk about your future, talk about your plans. And in this moment, this moment of crisis that Mark mentioned, he said, you know, I don't really have any plans. I mean, I, I don't have the kind of agenda I had in 2008. What am I supposed to talk about? It's all kind of thin gruel. So that moment is a very human moment. And But to your point, sir, I mean, what he did over the course of the next 24 hours was, with the help of his team, picked himself up from that very low point, something approaching like a real existential crisis, and they figured out a way to cross the psychic chasm. And they, they gave him, they found out a new way to, they, they changed their debate prep, not for the first time. Um, they, they counseled him to be a theatrical. They forced him to be what they said, what they would call fast and hammy in their debate prep. They would say, every time he would start to sound like a college professor again, they'd say, go f fast and hammy, fast and hammy. Every time he wouldn't attack Romney, John Kerry playing Romney in the debate prep, they'd say, punch him in the face. And they literally kind of kind of exhorted him like uh, like a like a, a, a little league soccer coaches, you know, like exhorted their guy across the finish line. And by the time he got up on stage at Hofstra, he did what he had to do, and at that point, you know, won that debate. And and, and in the minds of the Obama team, at least, more or less, at that point, was home free for election day. So it's a it's a moment of both of, of hu human frailty and a moment of human resilience uh, for President Obama in that in that scene in the book. Ramirez, you had a question right here. Uh, yes, my name is Ramirez Biddle. I'm a Clinton School student, class nine, and I very much thank you all for being here. Um, I waited a little bit after uh, working for a former boss of mine as a state senator to read the book and, and watch the movie, and I relived every campaign from from what you guys have done. Um, my question, I have two questions to, to the both of you. Um, how do candidates build these great political, these great campaign machines? And what are some things to avoid both from the campaign and the candidate themselves what are the what are some pitfalls to avoid that can destroy a well machine a well oiled machine campaign or a, good, a very good candidate? Not easily, and hiring the wrong people. <laughs> um, you know, the the our politics has changed a lot over the course of the last few years, and, and people try to sort of draw errors errors uh, and say you know where the demarcations are. I, I, my career started in 88 as a research in New York. The first campaign I covered out in the field was 92. So I think a lot in, in terms of the kind of questions you're asking about um, our last three presidents. The first time in the country's history, three, three term, two term presidents in a row. And all of them really extraordinary campaigners. And all of them could be a campaign manager for a presidential campaign. Now, if, you're, if, you have, if you are a candidate like that, and anyone in this room who's worked on a campaign probably has worked for a candidate who felt like they were a better campaign manager than the campaign manager. That's not always a good thing, but 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 it's good to know how to do it. And I think all three of them could could write you know a doctoral dissertation on what does it take to build a national organization. Um, it's changed though over time. Clearly, President Clinton wasn't using Facebook and 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 the internet to build a national operation. But both he and President Bush, working with Karl Rove and, and President Obama, working with David Plouffe and others, um, did have a sense of 
how to build a national organization, leveraging off relationships. You know, when I covered President Clinton, there wasn't a state we went to, and I went to 46 states with him in uh, 1991 and 1992, there wasn't a state we went to where he couldn't tell you every Democrat who'd ever run for office in the state and where they live now and what kind of network they had. And Karl Rove, George Bush, the same way. President Obama less so because he'd been around less, but he had the advantage of his brand and the technology. But I think he, he, part of it is the mindset of it's a big country, but it's a manageable thing if you break it down by state, by county, by town, and uh, focus on human beings. Uh, and whether you're doing that through technology or through, or through uh, walking the street, uh, that uh, capacity to imagine that it's a manageable task and then executing it, hiring the right people. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of pitfalls as well as how to build, I think, again, if you look at the three of them, and that's what I go on as much as anything else, because all three of them won two terms in this era, it's um, a combination of staff that is loyalists who've been with you a long time, uh, who know you, who you trust, who are willing to tell you the hard truths, along with uh, bring in new people who are kind of state of the art. So again, if you think of President Clinton's campaign, he had people like Bruce Lindsay and Mac McClarty uh, and uh, uh, Rodney Slater and other people from Arkansas who he, he felt he could trust and, and, and knew him well. But then he brought in George Stephanopoulos and James Carville and Paul Begala and, and others who he hadn't worked with uh, at, at all or very much in the past. President Bush did much the same thing. President Obama did much the same thing. I think that's really important. And, and, and if you think about it, if Secretary Clinton decides to run, I think she's got a challenge there. Because a lot of the people she's worked with in the past were in the last presidential campaign, and that did not end so happily. And I think the, 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 it's very unlikely that too many of the people who played prominent roles in her first campaign, if she does run again, would play a role the second time around. So she faces a challenge there that's a little unusual and hard for her to come up with the formula uh, that I suggested uh, intact the way the, the three last three winners did. And then I think the, 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 the two main things in terms of the candidate are um, run on what you believe in and run for a purpose. Um, well, I laugh when people speculate about some of these Republicans uh, maybe as strong candidates for, for, um, for 2016, because it's clear that they're talking to pollsters and they're going out and giving speeches, but you, you couldn't say today why they're running. You knew exactly why Bill Clinton was running and why George Bush ran and why President Obama ran. Go look at their announcement speeches and go look at their convention acceptance speeches. And they're thematically and programmatically, they're pretty darn close because they ran for a reason. They didn't decide to run and then try to come up with a reason. And the last thing is, uh, I think you gotta show who you are. Uh, one of the biggest problems you run into as a presidential candidate is that there's a gap between who you really are and, who the, and how the public sees you. Um, because um, uh, President Obama, I think one of his greatest gifts is the, the, the country sees the person who his friends see. He's very good at using the television and, and, and other means to communicate to people who he really is. I think part of Governor Romney, the reason he lost, I'd say one of the main reasons is he had a great deal of trouble conveying his humor and humanity and caring uh, on the public stage. And so if you can't do that, you shouldn't run. If you can't convey who you really are, uh, in, in the formats of the modern presidential campaign, you shouldn't run. we got time for one more question. I think back there, I think you all had your hand up. School, I think you had, did you have your hand up? Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to ask you mentioned a little bit. Having covered extensively two campaigns and two elections, what are your thoughts on 2016? Or is it too early? I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it's funny, we did an event the other night at Harvard with, uh, with Joe Klein, who said something I thought was smart, where he said that, you know, we're, journalists are very good at um, talking about the past. And we're not bad at talking about the present, we're generally pretty horrible about predicting the future. And we're both want to, pro, uh, to, to quote our favorite political philosopher, Yogi Berra, who says that prediction is always difficult, especially about the future. Um, <laughs> having said that, um, I think on the Democratic side, I think I'm expressing our collective judgment, which is that um, neither one of us is sure that Hillary Clinton is going to run, although all signs point to the likelihood that she is, and that if she runs, she will almost certainly be the Democratic nominee. 
that people who say, well, you know, people said she was inevitable in 2008 and Barack Obama came out of nowhere and, you know, there's no such thing as inevitable. We say yes, but please show me the Barack Obama on the horizon now who will beat her. And it is four years later. And, and the fact of Barack Obama's nomination and presidential tenure is a relevant fact here because for the Democratic Party, there were a couple of big pieces of historic business that were being dealt with in 2008. One was a potential first African American nominee, another was a potential first woman African nominee. The party's now had an African American nominee and president for two terms, or elected twice. There are a lot of people in the Democratic Party, and especially a lot of women in the Democratic Party, but a lot of people in the Democratic Party generally who think it is time for a woman to be the nominee of the party. And if that is the case, then there's no one who's better qualified or more deserving of it than Secretary Clinton and better positioned to get it. And I think that's the other relevant factor. Forget about it. all of that is, is atmospherics, um, not, not insignificant, but atmospherics. The, the mechanics of it are that among the groups that make up the Democratic nominating electorate, women, um, unmarried women, college-educated unmarried women in particular, African-Americans, Latinos, union households, um, gay and lesbians. Um, she has an extraordinary hold over all of those constituencies. Um, I mean, she's strong with, I mean, overwhelmingly strong with all of them, and she is by a country mile more capable of raising money than any other Democrat in the party. So if you add all those strengths together, she, I think, looks unstoppable. And the fact that she looks unstoppable will make it more of a self-fulfilling prophecy. There are a variety of Democrats from Joe Biden on down who might want to run for president, but all of them, none of them, you know, want to be run over by an oncoming train. And, and she looks pretty much like an oncoming train at this moment. So I think if she runs, she'll be the nominee, and, and, and then we'll see what happens in a general election. The Republican Party is a much, much, much more open question. And again, I'll just briefly say, I think Mark and I both agree there's, you know, um, it could be a more wide open and, and fractious field even than was the case in 2000. 12, although certainly a stronger one. Um, right now, you know, Chris Christie, uh, Jeb Bush, uh, and maybe Paul Ryan are kind of comprise the, 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 the A field of candidates in terms of their national, um, the, the, the extent to which they have a national, national following, could raise a lot of money and could conceivably be the kind of person who could unify the Republican Party, bring together the energy of the Tea Party um, and the grassroots on one side and the establishment wing of the party and the donor class. Um, you go below those three, um, there are a lot of names that are thrown around. Mark made this comment a second ago about how he kind of laughs about the fact that we don't know what they're running for. You know, people talk about Scott, Scott Walker. Um, uh, people talk about Bobby Jindal. People talk about others. Um, Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, Rand Paul. Um, th those people are at this moment, it's, they're kind of laughably um, insubstantial. And it's kind of laughably unclear. I mean, there's something funny about it at this moment. Now, many, any one of them could emerge as a plausible candidate and do more than they've currently done to make themselves plausible over the course of the next year, year and a half. But right now, those, the rest of those people, um, none of them really look like a president of the United States to me. Um, and I think none of them look like a president of the United States to Mark. So there's those three big Republicans, and any of those three might not run. Um, Chris Christie, Jeb Bush, or Paul Ryan. So that race is very wide open. And um, at this moment, the Republican Party, as strong as it is throughout the country in so many places, so many governorships, um, control of the House of Representatives, conceivably control of the Senate in 2014, has still done very little over the course of the last year to, to remedy the big problems it has with winning a presidential election. And um, it's lost the popular vote in the five of the last six. And it hasn't done much to fix the problems that it has to make it in a better, put it in a better position for 2016. So if you had to make a prediction today with a gun to our heads, I'd say probably Hillary Clinton is the most likely next president of the United States. But that is a, that is a, the that only, is by no means a sure thing. The only thing I would tweak is I agree with what John said about the Democratic side. I'm assuming uh, 2016 is an all Arkansas final with um, Hillary Clinton as the Democratic nominee and Republican Mark Pryor as the. <laughs> 
for those for those tweeting and blogging, note that I winked when I said that. No, I just I think Governor Huckabee is one of the underrated candidates in the in the Republican field, and uh, he's got a he's got to overcome the real distrust amongst the establishment wing, and he's got to find a way to raise money, and those are linked up. But I think uh, uh, having run before and having a lot, pretty good name ID and 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 that retail politics touch, I think he is on the field right now. I agree with John's first tier, but I think Governor Huckabee could be in that first tier if he finds a way to raise money and he puts his heart into it. So we could get that all Arkansas final. Have you heard that this would make a great holiday gift? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's thank John and Mark.